Next up on our list is Mr. John DeVries, Managing Director of BlackRock Mining. Uh, Mr. DeVries is a mining engineer with more than 35 years experience in business development, project development and operations. Previously, he was General Manager of Technical Services with St. Barbara and integral in the 2014 turnaround of the gold producer. Uh, Mr. DeVries held positions at BHP Nickel West and was Global Business Manager Advanced Mining Solutions with Orica Mining Services. His geographic experience includes Africa, the Pacific, the FSU, North America and South America. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, Honourable Minister, Ambassadors, um, welcome to, to Australia. When they did Africa Down Under last year, I was in Africa telecasting to down under at about four o'clock in the morning. So it's really good to see ADU back here with, with Africa. Um, so on behalf of the Australian mining industry, welcome. Reason we spent a good portion last year in, in Tanzania was to complete the free carried interest agreement. Um, and out of the, the free carried interest agreement, we've managed to, to develop the operating conditions, the investment conditions to work in, in Tanzania. Interestingly, one of the outcomes of that was the name of the company, is the Faru Graphite Corporation, uh, which is 16% owned by the government of Tanzania, 84% by, by BlackRock. Um, Faru, for those who don't speak Swahili, is rhinoceros. Um, so if you're into uh, a tech unicorn, we've got a battle-hardened, armour-plated unicorn for you in the form of a rhino. A um, couple of things about rhinos, they don't back up very well and they don't jump. And that's been really critical to the pathway we've done. It's been very methodical, it's been carefully thought out, and I think produced a pretty good outcome where we are now. A little bit about where we're at with the company. We've pursued a, uh, an integrated strategy. So we are the only graphite player who has a Western anode producer on the share register in the form of POSCO. Now POSCO does two things for us. It brands us as uh, being Western, but critically POSCO standing in the market to take one third of our production and turn that into anode. And for those who don't know what anode looks like, that's it. That's the stuff that goes into lithium ion batteries. Um, qualification, four years and about $25 million will get you there. We've built out the team this year, really, really important. Um, so we've now built out the C-suite and we've got a C-suite here in place that is really capable of executing. So we've now got the engineering bench strength, we've got the financial bench strength, and we've got the people and the ESG bench strength to really take the project forward. And this is, again, part of the deliberate strategy, is getting ourselves debt ready so that when we do commence the debt process, we've got a very high level of confidence in being able to, to attain that debt. It's been a big year. Free carried interest. For those who'd been in Tanzania in uh, 2017, securing free carried interest now, is a, is, a, is a very, very massive goal. Securing free carried interest allows us to do a couple of things straight away. A 500 tonne pilot plant, um, put that into perspective, 500 tonne pilot plant produces 42 tonnes of concentrate, 15 tonnes of which you can put into a commercial scale spheronising plant. That'll produce, in our case, about seven tonnes of concentrate, uh, seven tonnes of SPG. That then goes to Korea, gets turned into anode, and goes into long duration, large scale battery tests. That's what pre-qualification is all about. We've got a term sheet with POSCO now around the offtake. We've appointed our debt advisors and we've really started to build up the, um, the front end loading. We've completed feed, we've commenced resettlement. So we're putting in place the building blocks you need to be able to execute the project seamlessly. A little bit about uh, where we sit in the battery revolution and there's a, there's a lot of press going on in this, but really two key takeouts out of this is if you step back and go to 40,000 feet in the battery space, they all need lithium, they all need graphite. And if you miss the lithium boom, the next one is the graphite boom. 
So if you're thinking of being technology agnostic, do I go nickel, do I go cobalt, do I go um, battery grade manganese, you don't need to make a solution, uh, a decision on that, just simply step into the graphite space because you know that's a, a reasonably safe bet. We're seeing natural flake increase its market share over time. And that's a function of, of two things. Is firstly, increasing availability of natural flake outside of China. Um, but as we start to look at the industry getting really focused on the ESG footprint is when you're starting to, to look at the carbon intensity of making synthetic, it is not uh, competitive against natural if you actually take the full ESG cost there. So we're seeing an increase in, in natural and uh, we think that's a trend that's going to continue. I think the final point is you can make anode out of natural for about a third of the cost of synthetic. So certainly there's a, there's a good economic argument there as well. That leads to where do we go in terms of market shortfall? Um, and if I get you know, four analysts into a room, I'll have 16 forecasts. But the general consensus is there is a major underlap about to happen in graphite. And I'll put that into perspective. Our project's gone reasonably quickly in that we have gone from scoping study in 2017 to where we're almost ready to start construction in 22. It takes 10 years to take a mine from you know, early stage discovery right through to commissioning. In 10 years, if I follow forecasts, we're looking at needing 10 mahengis to provide the battery feed, assuming 100% of our concentrate goes into battery feed. That's a massive underlap. So we're of a view in this space there will be multiple winners and I think the truly exciting part about being in this space is we're seeing multiple strategies deployed. So over the next couple of years we'll start to see about what is the right way to work in this space. Our approach has been a, a tech heavy and a, and, a, and a very, very careful approach and we think it's the, the appropriate way but certainly it's starting to, to get very, very interesting. Why this gets really critical is this ultimately ends up being a China story. 70% of graphite comes from China. 100% of SPG processing occurs inside China. So the pursuit of integrated supply chains gets to be very, very critical. Our approach to this is rather than try and compete against China with our own technology, is to collaborate and we do that with POSCO. So POSCO buys our concentrate, works through their existing supply chain and then produces anode. And very similar to Pilbara Metal strategy, if you think about Pilbara when they got there, Pilbara built the mine, got cash flow. Once they got cash flow, they could then start to move into downstream processing. And that's absolutely the right approach to do. A very similar approach that we want to do. So you think about graphite, where it's used. Um, if you walk past our booth, you'll find uh, brake pads, which comes out of uh, medium size or large flake, engine gaskets, which comes out of jumbo. The message here is while we talk about the lithium iron boom, in our case, it's about a third of our product. Two thirds actually go into industrial manufactured goods. And it's not the sort of stuff that you normally see. You'll walk into Bunnings, uh, you'll buy yourself an electric drill, it's got graphite in a couple of shapes and forms. You buy a car, it's got graphite in the seals, the gaskets, the fire suppressants. So you need to think of this as being an industrial mineral uh, that gets used where industry exists. Pricing. Pricing's picking up at the moment. And the interesting thing about graphite is it's very seasonal. So where most of the production occurs in China is, is right up north in Helenjiang. Um, so Telenjang, if you're in China, it's southern Siberia if you're in Russia. But basically this place freezes solid for about four months of the year. So what you find is there's a stock in, stock out cycle. So we can see last year where the stock build didn't occur and we had a good rally in prices. We've not seen that retreat in pricing as stock has come back as the mines have started. So we're up about 30% year on year. We're just not seeing the evidence as the stock build has occurred this year. So we sort of suspect in the next couple of months we'll start to see some pretty strong support for the graphite prices. It's just there's not a stock build that's occurred. And critically, last year was the first year China became a net importer of graphite. So as even China is starting to, to struggle to find a raw material to go into 
into their businesses. So a little bit about Mahengi itself. Um, it's a great graphite, it's pure. We can produce a 97% concentrate. Two thirds of it is large flake, but it's the location, it's the geography that's a key driver here. And we got two key features that really come together. Our proximi proximity to 200 kV hydro, so it gives us a, a large scale access to grid power at reliable voltages at reliable grid power. It is sandwiched between two hydro stations. So if you're an ESG sensitive customer, getting your graphite to support your vehicles in the EV transition from hydro powered mines is a good idea. The second feature is our access to the port of Dar es Salaam. Uh, we're proximal again to the Tazara Railway and, and Dar is an increasingly important deep water container port. Um, so reliable logistics back to customers are very, very fundamental to success in this space and, and Dar is a key part of our, our solution. So when you're starting to look at the graphite space, yes, good graphite's important, but good graphite that sustains at the bottom of the cost curve is a lot more important. And that's the advantage we have at Mahengi. Numbers are from the 2018-2019 enhanced DFS. We are working on updating them as part of our feed study. Um, it was a difficult decision. Do we come out early with some numbers? But the approach we've adopted here gets back to our pretty methodical uh, standard. And, and that is the numbers we want to release in the near future will be audited by an independent technical expert. So we'll be able to stand up there and say, these are audited numbers, they've been reviewed. There's a lot more reliance in those numbers. I do not want to be coming in here and saying, oh, we've got to change this by a million here or a million there. So, um, but when we unpack the numbers as we see them now, the thesis remains, it's uh, high value, really good IRR and a crawl walk run strategy works beautifully. So for us, it's a successful strategy. We'll continue it. ESG, massive differentiator. Um, I've spent uh, three days with banks this week. And uh, what was a one hour meeting turned into a two hour meeting. And I guarantee it was about now 15 into the meeting when we finished ESG and started talking about the economics. So if you're unable to articulate where you stand on ESG, your ability to get quality finance is going to be challenged. Mahingi is unique. We've got hydropower for grid. We've got a low strip ratio mine that produces a low footprint. We are dry stacking. We don't have a wet tailings dam. It means we're not competing with our traditional landholders for water. It means we've got one of the lowest water consumption rates in the business. Again, critical differentiating factors. What we've done is we've doubled down on this. We're updating our ESIA at the moment. It's part of the bank process. And that's coming out at EP4 standards. It's coming out at IFC standards. Again, if you want quality debt, you need to be at those standards. And they are pretty exacting standards. If it's BHP or RIA, exactly the same standards that they would be working to. It's probably the most important slide in the deck. It's my personal favourite. Why is graphite different? If we're dealing with copper, zinc, lead, LME, grade A copper is LME, grade A copper. You don't care if it's come from Olympic Dam, Zambia, or what used to be Russia. It's chemically consistent, so you can guarantee its performance. What's unique about graphite, what's unique about this stuff, is the crystal structure that exists in the flake is the crystal structure that exists in the product. The residual chemical signature that exists in the flake is the residual chemical signature that exists in the product. Therefore, you need to put a lot of product in front of a customer before they'll believe the stuff works. If you're Tesla, you're issuing a 10-year warranty on your battery, you have to have confidence that that battery is going to perform in 10 years' time. That takes a lot of time and a lot of investment. In our case, four and a half years, around 25 million bucks. And involves you know, over 600 tonnes of pilot plant 
optimization to generate products for our customers. So that's the difference in graphite. Now I say, you don't have to do this. You can totally ignore that, build the mine and hope it works. That's not the approach we're doing. The reason we're not doing that approach is when I'm talking to uh, the heavyweights in the banking sector, they want that product off take de-risk. And the only way to de-risk that is a contract. And a contract with an end user means you're qualified. That, that is a decision we made four years ago to do that. And that was part of our financing strategy four years ago. A little bit about development timetable. Um, those who have observed, we've got the special mining license issued to us overnight. That's a major empowering uh, document. That allows us to now step up and move forward very quickly. So the development timeline is uh, under the SML. We'll uh, commence the finance process shortly when the uh, ITE work's finished with a view that we'll get into construction end of this year, early next year. Um, and then at the moment, it's somewhere around between a 15, 18 month run to build it, depending on the wet season bill. And uh, from there, we, 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 we build module one, cash flow module two, three and four. Next steps, um, grant of the SML, um, done. Complete early works and resettlement. Resettlement's started, have a look at the photo at the back of our booth and we're building out our team now. Um, Offtake milestones clearly connected to the SML, so uh, as we resolve the SML, um, we start to see uh, some expectations around offtake. And project debt, I don't want to say too much about project debt at the moment, all I can say is it's a very intensive process is underway that we hope to have some news flow around that pretty soon. I'll leave that, uh, thank you.